if, as I assert, that better humans make better leaders, then what is the responsibility of a better human to create what I refer to as systemic belonging. We live in society where there is systemic othering, whether it's racist, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic. We are constantly turning the other into someone who is less than. And to my mind, the only answer to systemic problems are systemic solutions. I'm Ron Jor, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Jerry Colonna is the CEO and co-founder of Reboot.io, an executive coaching and leadership development firm whose coaches and facilitators are committed to the notion that better humans make better leaders. For nearly 20 years, he has used the knowledge gained as an investor, an executive, and a board member for more than 100 organizations to help entrepreneurs and others to lead with humanity, resilience, and equanimity. He's been called the CEO whisperer and the coach with the spider tattoo and has taken refuge in the Buddhist Dharma tradition. Previous to his career as a coach, he was a partner with J.P. Morgan Partners, the private equity arm of J.P. Morgan Chase, and before that, had launched Flatiron Partners with partner Fred Wilson. Flatiron became one of the most successful early-stage investment programs in the New York City area. Today, he lives in Boulder, Colorado. We had this conversation in mid-March 2022, and that's two years into the worldwide outbreak of COVID and a couple of weeks into Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I was excited and nervous to talk to Jerry, who is famous for making podcasters cry. We've also had a brief chat months before preparing for this interview, and I've already had a taste of his radical inquiry approach to coaching. So as expected, this did not end up being a regular interview. While we got to explore his history and his ideas in his childhood a little bit, Jerry turned his radical inquiry on me, as expected, and you'll get to hear a pretty detailed coaching slash therapy session on this podcast and dive deeper into my fears and insecurities along the way. I have to say I found it deeply therapeutic, both at the time and now weeks later when I re-listened. I hope it will be interesting to you as well. So we covered many topics here, so we'll give you a little bit of an outline. We talked about COVID and how it exposed the interdependence, but also the inequality of American society. Then we had a really interesting discussion of leadership in the context of the Ukraine war and how when leaders don't address their vulnerable and wounded parts, that always kind of expresses itself in violence. And we talked about that in the context of malignant narcissism with Putin and also with Trump. We cover his childhood and how he became keenly aware of how people around him are feeling. We talk about his career in venture and, and how he veered from that into coaching. Then we go <laughs> a little bit into my therapy session where he starts pointing he is his radical inquiry, his coach mind on me. And we dive into my tendency to hide, to not want to be very active on social, at least on not publicly on Twitter. My fear of being judged, my fear of not being seen or not being appreciated. And, uh, and you really get to see Jerry's mind at work and how he works with me and helps me understand and make peace with these feelings and and find a way to work within them. And we talk about what it means to bring your whole self to every challenge in your life at work and and any other moment. And we talk about how everything is an opportunity for self growth and to practice that. Finally, we cover his reboot system and method and book. And we 
talk about how everybody in life basically is looking for love, safety, and belonging. And this was a very different, a very meaningful process for me. And I hope that you'll find it beneficial as well. It definitely affected the way that I approach putting myself out there and allowing myself to be more visible on social media. And shortly after this interview was recorded, I definitely did start being more vocal. And an amazing thing happened. As I started being more vocal on Twitter and other platforms, we got more and more downloads for this podcast. So the podcast started growing very, very rapidly. And so I guess I owe a, a big thank you to Jerry for challenging my assumptions and helping me pinpoint his insecurities. Jerry assured me that this is helpful to other people to hear. So I really hope that would prove true and that you'll find this episode really helpful to you in your journey as well. This conversation with Jerry is one of a dozen or so weekly conversations we already have lined up for you with thinkers, designers, makers, authors, philosophers, entrepreneurs, and investors who are working to change our world for the better. So follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app or head over to remakepod.org to subscribe. And now let's jump right in with Jerry Colonna. All right, I'm sitting here with Jerry Colonna. Jerry, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a delight to see you again. We are in transition. So in, in the recent couple of years, I started with like a big COVID exploration. And I feel like now I have to also add the Ukraine exploration before we dive into our own conversation. So yeah. I'll start with COVID. I would love to hear how it affected you personally, how it affected you professionally, and then what surprised you? Well, you know, we're recording effectively two years, around two years since the wave really hit the United States. So the last week or so, I've been particularly mindful of what life was like two years ago. Like a lot of folks, I think it was a series of different experiences. There was the belief that it was going to be a relatively short time, what felt like potentially a long time, like a month, mm -hmm. that we would be struggling with this. And so there was a tremendous amount of anxiety wrapped around uncertainty. And then it evolved for me into a kind of interesting experience because in the United States in particular, uh, shortly, a few months afterwards, we had the murder of George Floyd, mm. which brought into undeniable, shocking experience of the reality of so many folks uh, already. I, I am a white, straight man, and I do, do not experience the sense of othering that many others do. And all of a sudden it became, in my mind, inextricably linked, that there was this kind of interesting dynamic going on of a profound demonstration of our interdependence, because that's kind of what a virus does, right? Mm -hmm. I could make you sick 5,000 miles away just by passing it from one person to another. And so therefore you need me to take care of myself and I need you to take care of yourself, right? That's a great demonstration of interdependence. But it also mm. became a stark reminder of the injustice and inequality in our societies, especially the healthcare inequities. During that period, my partner Ali and I bought a farm outside of Boulder. We moved mm. to a 40 acre farm with three horses and a 19 year old cat named Ginger. And the, like, again, the dissonant experience, I got healthier, I got calmer, I began eating better. You know, the loss of travel in my life was a net positive. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, lastly, in terms of work, the demand for what I and my colleagues do clearly went through the roof mm -hmm. uh, because there's just so much suffering out there. This week, we had our first in-person all-team meeting for the company in two and a half years. And 
several team members had never met each other before mm. in person. And I know that's not a unique experience. What surprised you about this? Did you feel like you learned anything about people, humanity? I think about me personally was I realized, you know, in the book I wrote, there's a chapter about needing to stand still even while your hair is on fire. And I wrote that cognizant of my tendency and many people's tendency to use motion to cover suffering, to cover up for a sense of inadequacy. See, if I move fast, then it proves that I'm productive. And if yeah. I'm productive, then I'm valuable. And if I'm valuable, then I'm worthy of love, right? One of the things that the pandemic did was a kind of slow rolling retreat where you had no choice but to sit still, mm. where the choice to actually move and go somewhere and do something required an enormous amount of attention. Like, am I going to be safe? How many people are going to be there? Should I wear a mask? Should I not wear a mask? Will they be vaccinated? Will they not be vaccinated? Right. Mm. And when I took my refuge vows as a Buddhist almost 20 years ago, mm. I added a precept to not eat animals. And not because I have a judgment about vegetarianism or not, but because I wanted to slow the heck down and think before I put something in my mouth. Mm. And in a sense, COVID did the same thing for me. I had to think mm. before I acted. Now, now it, was, it was such a cognitive dissonance where even, mm -hmm. let, let alone people who are less well-to-do or in countries where there's a, less of a functioning healthcare system, even among my friends who are in the same, theoretically in the same category than me, I had a similar experience to yours. I lost weight. I became healthier. I ate mm -hmm. better. I read more 19th century novels mm -hmm. and, you know, right. and then I had friends who were deeply, deeply suffering from not right. being able to be around people, trying to understand that kind of the same event can have such su such divergent impact uh, on, on people. That's maybe the thing that I learned the most. And I think that divergence, I second that, and I'd add to it, that divergence could be within the same human body, right? Mm. I can be both healthier and suffering more mentally. It has been a profound experience and one that I hope we collectively, societies, do not lose the lessons because mm. they were hard won. I yeah. mean, there are whole generations of children whose learning has been set back. There are political divisions in the United States that sometimes I wonder if they'll ever be healed. And, and it's incredibly challenging. And implicit in that is an opportunity for even greater consciousness. Mm. Now, which, which leads me to the war in Ukraine. Have you been able to process that? Um, I have no extra insight into what's happening there. Just as people find themselves suddenly positioned as experts in pandemics and viruses, they suddenly find themselves experts in war. Mm -hmm. And I'm not an expert in that. So I'll put that to the side. But I will say that, you know, one of the things that I've been saying for many years and one of the ways in which I dedicate my life in support of leadership is that when those who hold power refuse to grapple with the parts of themselves uh, that really are rooted in woundedness, mm -hmm then violence is the consequence. And whether it's, you know, quite frankly, to get a little political on my side for a moment, whether it's Donald Trump really not being able to resolve conflicts with his father, mm. resulting in a kind of narcissism that was just awful to experience, or Vladimir Putin's attempt to somehow assert himself because you know, his reported net worth of $100 billion isn't somehow enough, right? And that there's this gaping hole 
you know, uh, need mm. there. And I know we don't want to see that piece of it. We want to be angry about mm. what's going on. But the truth is that when we raise children without the ability to process their suffering, violence happens. I hope that we come to understand that malignant narcissism among leaders leads to a kind of horrific fundamentalism in constantly making enemies of other people. In a sense, we have a collective responsibility not only to preserve democracy against authoritarian structures, but to stand up to kind of a belief system that if we imbue the strong man leader with incredible powers, that somehow we as a people will be safer. We have to confront the fears that lie within our societies that have us turn to authoritarian strong men mm. as leaders mm. and support them. So long-winded yeah. analysis. I said I wasn't an expert. But I know, <laughs> it's wonderful because this is about on. leadership. In, in some ways, I look at this, and I've been following Putin for some years. I'm a student of history. And um, mm -hmm. and he was, to me, clearly someone who just didn't get what the big fuss is about, like freedom and individual rights. Just doesn't get, just doesn't mm -hmm. get it. And in a way, I think this is like the world's most expensive lesson that you could possibly have for Putin, where he just assumed... Mm -hmm. It doesn't have value. And if I come in with, you know, some soldiers, then they'll give in, mm -hmm. right? Because that his power is all that matters. Mm -hmm. And suddenly he sees, oh, wait, there's, okay, I have 100,000 soldiers, but there's 44 million people saying no. It's a very clear case because they were part of the same country ju just a couple of decades ago. Right. Uh, and now they're like, no, you're not taking us back. So in some ways, I wonder... If he's wondering about this, it's like, wait, is it so different to live under Russia than it is to live, you know, mm. in a democratic society mm. that millions of people will just make mm. Molotov cocktails and go go fight in the street? I, he must be wondering because he wasn't, that was clearly that he wasn't expecting that. He might be wondering. He might be wondering, but I would be surprised if he's wondering. Mm. I'm not a psychologist and I'm not qualified to diagnose, but I suspect that he, like a lot of authoritarian figures and those drawn to authoritarianism, have a profound malignant narcissism at, at mm. root. And narcissism itself is rooted in a deep and profound wound. Mm. And one of the consequences is that the other person doesn't exist. Right. You can always tell you're engaged with a narcissist when you walk away feeling annihilated, feeling wiped mm -hmm. out. And one of the root causes of this kind of violence is to turn the other person into a non-human, mm -hmm. to not see their humanity. And I suspect, although I don't know, that a young 19-year-old Russian soldier hops out of a, tra a tank with a rifle drawn and looks out and sees a woman who looks like his grandmother. And that kid is not a narcissist. That mm. kid might very well be dropping his rifle mm. and saying, what the hell am I doing? Let's hope that's part of what's going on here. You said it's a profound lesson for him. Unfortunately, it's a lesson for all of us mm. that we have to consistently and constantly elevate our awareness of humanity. That person across from me, in my anger, can cease to be a human being. And once mm. that happens, all bets are off. We have seen this time and time and time again. And mm. unfortunately, we continue to have to learn this lesson that in a blink of an eye, we can turn someone that we think of as a sibling, Ukrainians to Russians, into non-humans. Mm -hmm. And then we can pull a trigger. Mm -hmm. And that's the movement that we have to be careful about because that's not isolated 
to Vladimir Putin by any stretch of the imagination. That propensity right. exists within all people. And that's what we have to push up against. That's what the wisdom traditions in every society have taught us. Y you mm. want to understand every single religion? It boils down to one simple thing. See the other as a sibling, not as the enemy. Mm. Yeah. And whenever we see the other as the enemy, we are going against all of the wisdom traditions that are the best of humanity. Hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so we have kind of a way into, I won't say the meat of our conversation, but the, the middle part of the sandwich of the conversation. Um, hmm. I have this, this question that I usually ask, which is, what's something you learned in childhood or early in life that is still guiding you today? still very alive in you today? Well, I'll reframe the question just slightly because I don't see it so much as a lesson mm. as much as a skill that I developed. And that is this notion of hypervigilance. For those who are familiar with my work, they'll know that I grew up with enormous violence in a household. I grew up with mental illness. I grew up with my father's alcoholism. And one of the responses, one of the adaptations I developed was to be keenly aware of how people are feeling, constantly and keenly. And that permeates everything I do, everything I am as an adult. Even now, you know, I'm holding the back of my mind stories you've shared with me of, you know, a friend who was suffering. Hmm when we're talking about universal suffering. So I've got one eye on the universal theoretical, let's talk about the impact of the pandemic, and another eye on your heart. Yeah. And that's the positive aspect of that adaptation that I developed as a child. What I've learned subsequent to being a child is that I can use that to build an empathetic bridge so that I can be more close to the person and feel more connection, even if it's just through a piece of software called Squadcast, which mm. we're using right now. And those are skills that have served you throughout life and probably are very much alive today in coaching and working with people and helping. More alive today in me than they have ever been, both as a leader in my own company and as a coach, and as a life partner, and as a parent, and hopefully as a friend. That means that there's some hope for people who are left with a similar legacy from their oh childhood. My, there's always hope. Yeah. There's always hope. Yeah. Remember this line from Carl Jung, I am not what has happened to me. Mm. I am what I choose to become. Mm. It's such a profoundly important statement of agency. And for those who might resonate with stories of childhood challenges, take a deep breath. The adult in you is capable. Your child survived. You are now an adult and you're fully capable of turning all that has happened to you into superpowers so that you mm -hmm. can become the adult that you want to be. That is possible. It's mm. hard, but it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure this will be resonating with a lot of people. It definitely resonates with me. Um, mm. So before kind of diving into your doing and the current doing, um, I, I want to understand that transition because I think with those sensitivities and those skills, you actually went into the venture world for a while mm -hmm. before landing where you are. So how did you find yourself, you know, working at Flatiron Partners with Fred Wilson? I think this is a, you know, well-known story. Mm -hmm. What were the first steps that led you to that world? And then what led you out of it? My first job as, a, as an adult was working as a technology reporter for a magazine. 
And I'd gotten that job as an internship and I sort of parlayed that into a full-time position and ended up staying with that company for nearly 10 years. And it was at that time that I began to be exposed to the venture capital business really by happenstance. And so I actually joined a venture firm before starting Flatiron with Fred. And I was there for about 18, 24 months. It was a miserable experience. (laughs) I liked one or two partners, but I really didn't like working with the folks that I was working with. There was a deep and profound values conflict, Mm. which I internalized as there's something wrong with me. I don't understand the venture business, that sort of thing. So that was sort of the pathway through. But I think if you wanted to look at a through line, and this was true both in my time as a reporter and then my time as an investor and even my time today, I am driven by an insatiable curiosity. I mean, I'm the kind of dad that when my kids and I would be visiting something, I stop and read every damn plaque. You know, if I see something interesting at this point, I open up my phone and I go on Wikipedia and I try to find out the image. I just am endlessly curious. And I'm going to reference the books on your, over your shoulder. I noticed that you've got a copy of William Blake's poetry. I noticed mm. that you've got the Lord of the Rings on your other side, right? So there's a piece of my brain that's like sitting and saying, mm. okay, we've got to have a conversation about that. We've got to have a conversation about Blake. We've got to have a <laughs> My friend Seth Godin's book is over your shoulder, right? And it animates me. Even to this day, I probably read, you know, a book a week, maybe two. And one of the hardest things about reading books on Kindle is that I immediately go and if I find some fact that I think is interesting in the book, I'll look it up on Wikipedia. So it takes yeah. twice as long to read the book yeah, yeah, sure. as it would normally. So that's really what motivated me. And then when I became an investor, it was like a kid in a candy shop. Mm. You know, interesting people all day long would give me an opportunity to talk about their best ideas. Right. And we just riff. The problem was that by my late 30s, that activity, which was really enlivening, was overshadowed by the negative aspect of feeling like I needed to resolve some deeper issues within me Mm. that was leading me to be outwardly successful but inwardly miserable. Mm. And that dissonance became unbearable to the point where I was depressed and suicidal and needed to make a profound structural change in my life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I referenced this before. At 38 years old, I had to just sit the hell down and stop moving and figure out my life. In hindsight now, I see that it was part and parcel of a larger movement, which we blithely referred to as midlife crisis, but it was really more profound than that. It was the existential house of cards that I had built to survive my childhood and get into adult Mm. had collapsed, thank God, because it was inappropriate. Um, And uh, my heart broke open. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Can I share you, a bit of wisdom? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Parker Palmer is one of my teachers, and he likes to reference a story that Jacob Needleman, the philosopher, shares. If I don't get this right, forgive me, but it's a Hasidic tale. And the tale goes like this. A student comes to the rabbi and says to the rabbi, Rabbi, why does the Talmud tell us to place the words of the Torah upon our hearts? Why does it not say, place them in our hearts? And the rabbi says, our hearts being the way they are, as hard as it is, the words must be placed upon our hearts until our heart breaks open and the words can fall in. Hmm. That story just kills me every time. Because implicit in it is that The wisdom, the divine wisdom can only come into us when our hearts break Mm. or specifically our hearts break open. Yeah. And that openness is the key. 
I think that's what happened to me. It's beautiful. It resonates with me with, with, with what the Buddha said. I think there's a, there's a place where he says no one comes to the Dharma except f- through suffering. And it's definitely true. I, ne- I never, <laughs> I don't know if it says more about me or about this, but I never fully trust someone who doesn't seem to have suffered in life. Like, mm-hmm. it's like, I don't, like, I don't even know how to relate to that. I understand the feeling. I understand yeah. the feeling. If, if if I may, let me talk a little bit like your older brother. Sure. Be careful of romanticizing suffering. Hmm. There is nothing romantic about suffering. And I think that the wisdom in both of our stories, in both of our quotes, is less of a prescription than a description. It's not that the Buddha is saying, in order to become wise, you must suffer. I think what the Buddha is saying is suffering is a part of life. And as we, as he taught in the second noble truth, the denial of suffering increases suffering. Yeah. And so the pathway is to understand that suffering is part of life. That suffering, what do we do? I feel miserable. So we tell ourselves, or I tell myself, there must be something wrong with me. And so we exacerbate suffering. Instead of seeing the suffering as an experience of universal humanity, you suffer. I suffer. You were wounded in childhood. I was wounded in childhood. Yeah. How do I know that? Because you're human. Yeah. What you suffered may be different from what I suffered, but that doesn't mean you didn't suffer. I don't know. Does that framing help? I think so. I think so. You're listening to Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. If you're listening on a podcast app, you already know how to follow podcasts. So please follow this one. If you're listening in a browser, just go to remakepod.org to find links to all the major podcast players where you can follow our show. So I resonate very much with a lot of the specifics that you shared. So I think that hypervigilance or hypersensitivity mm-hmm. to people's moods is mm-hmm. definitely something that I share. I think that for much of my life, and actually this may be one of the things that is still very active today, this really strong need that I need to be independent and I can depend on people. You know, I, I need to be okay on my own. I don't need anyone's approval. Um, I recently made the decision to go on, be more active on social media to promote what I think is great content that we're creating. And, and it was really hard for me because I, I cut that part out of my life very intentionally. I, I don't want to be too active on social media because I don't want to care what people say about me and I don't want to get sucked into that realm. I mean, in some ways it's avoiding vulnerability, but also like, I don't want to hear what people have to say about what I'm writing. Like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to hear criticism. Mm -hmm. I don't want to care about criticism. Mm -hmm. And I know that I do on some level. So I kind of shy Mm -hmm. away from speaking up sometimes. And so I think that's, and that's definitely a, a, a more challenging thing on the positive side. I think having grown up with a lot of disconnection and a lot of Mm. resignation. I became allergic to these things and it's led me to be one of the most hopeful and one of the most Mm. communicative people that I know. And, you know, my life is about design and working together, Mm. connecting around solving things Mm -hmm. together. And so today I know hope and connection 
our core to who I am. And it's because of, I think, this deep understanding of where disconnection and resignation leads you. Like you can, I've seen the end of the other road and I just refuse to go there. Yeah. May I share what I heard and sure. reflect it back to you? Um, I experienced a brave man who showed me his tender heart. Hmm. And I am aware of the struggle, what seems to be a struggle instead of conflicts for you. Hmm. Um, because you care so much what other people say and feel about you, you're reluctant to put yourself out there and hmm. be vulnerable to that, what they might say negatively. And yet, here you are, mm. putting yourself out there. Yeah. Sure, you might project into the guests uh, a, a genuine but somewhat defensive curiosity. I'll ask them to tell their story, but I'll move yep. it into the background to where it's safe. But the craving for the connection is quite powerful. Yeah. Am I seeing things well? I think so. I think th there's, a, there's a longing to share mm -hmm. from, from my own heart, from mm -hmm. my own mind. And this podcast is a safe way to start experimenting with that through other people by choosing the right people sure. to bring on the show and asking them questions and letting them speak. And I am shielded from judgment. At the same time, I am thinking about how to break that barrier and also put myself more out there. And it's a process. So, so I think you're very much correct. So be careful right now. There could be a little bit of self-criticism that comes in. Mm. Sure, I ask these people to be real and authentic, but I'm hiding mm. behind the question. Mm. Easy. Mm. Easy. Your heart is tender. Mm. Okay? You have experienced suffering. You've probably been hypercriticized. You've probably experienced shame which is an awful force in the world. Mm. And so that tender part of you needs a little care. And acknowledging that will call forth the adult and realize that in order to create the world that we want to exist, we're humans, for example. You and I share this belief, I think, we want human beings to find comfort and connection with one another. Yeah. We want a world of empathy. In order to do that, mindful of the tenderness, the opportunity is to be brave, is to share. What do I mean by that? When I was 38 and I was entering a, my second deep, profound experiences of depression. The books that came to me as life rafts were three. Pema Children's When Things Fall Apart, mm -hmm. Sharon Salzberg's Faith, and Parker Palmer's Let Your Life Speak. And the common denominator between those three books was the authentic presence of the author. There mm -hmm. was no... BS. There was no hiding. There was no didactic finger wagging. Let me tell you how you should live your life, which as a kid from Brooklyn, I would find an anathema and run the other way. The universal experience of all three of those books was that they showed their own flaws, their own vulnerabilities. Mm. They were real. You know, years later, I had the great good fortune of becoming friends with all three of them. And in many conversations I've had with Sharon, she talked about 
Faith being the most difficult book she ever wrote because she was fully present with her own suffering as a means of emotional connection to the other person. Mm. I offer that because that became a model for me. And as a result, I know that it has been healing for me. I think there's definitely some of the things that I write, when I open up, uh, they are much more powerful. Um, mm. I, haven't, I haven't shared mm. some of these things yet outside of my circle of friends because they're still a work in progress. But I think that's... I think that's absolutely right. And that's also the feedback I'm getting about the podcast is I need to bring more of myself into it. Mm. And at the same time, I also had feedback of what a wonderful, spacious place you create for the other person, which I do want to keep. So there might be other channels. So notice notice the belief yeah. system that might be there for a moment, okay. which is that if I show up, I'm somehow taking space from the other person. Hmm. And I want you to know that as a podcast guest, this part of the conversation is actually more enlivening for me. You know, I'll take it all the way back to our conversation about authoritarian leaders and all that stuff. Let's imagine, because I coach leaders, let's imagine for a moment that a leader showed up in the similar way that I'm suggesting you show up. We were talking about political leaders and we were talking about Putin. Let's contrast Mm. him for a moment with Zelensky. Okay. Is Zelensky being real? Is he being vulnerable? I think more than Putin for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Much more than Putin. He's showing up and saying, this is my struggle. These are my people. My heart is breaking. Is he angry? Yes. Is he flawed? Yes. Mm. But that's the kind of leadership that we really want to see in the world. When he shows up on one of his videos with his Ukrainian army t-shirt and his weeks old beard and his ragged, tired bags under his eyes, I want yeah. to jump in the foxhole and stand next to him. Yeah, a lot of people do, yeah. Right? And it's not just because of the wrongness of the aggression that's going on, but because there is a sensibility that this person isn't, I'm going to curse now, bullshitting. They're real with heartache and pain and suffering. And it's like, and then it makes you feel like, Roll up my sleeves and let me do the work with you. Mm. Now, yeah. in a smaller scale, translate that to your company. Yeah, I, I, I think that I have no problem sharing with anyone my anxieties around like, oh, I don't, I've never done sales before. I'm reading a book about it. I'm trying to figure mm. it out. I no, It's not something that's hard for me to share and be real about. But I think maybe the most sensitive thing for me is like, this is how I see the world or this is, you know, this is something I really believe in and, or, and maybe it's not something that everybody believes in or maybe it's influenced by my perspective or, or something creative that I wrote. When you put yourself out there like that, what's yeah. the story that you tell yourself before you start feeling the fear? They're not going to get me. They're not going to see me. They're not going to understand mm. They're not going to understand you. They're not going to see you. Just hang out in that spot for a moment. How deeply held is the belief, is the fear that you're not going to be seen, you're not going to be understood? I think it's very deep in time, but I think I've also Mm. done some processing. So I, I think I'm on, of two minds for everything I do. I, part of me thinks they will get it. And so part of me thinks they won't mm-hmm. get it. And, and I have to be brave in the moment, but it, it's not like it's so powerful that it's overwhelming. So that's very fortunate for me at this point in my life. It wasn't always like this, but. Right. So let's talk where, about the time when it wasn't. Yeah. You know, so fortunate. Let's go yeah, there. Time travel. I've been writing for a very long time. So I think I was probably 11 or 12 when I started writing 
poetry. Mm. So the mm. rawest thing that you could do. And I wasn't showing it to anybody. Mm. And uh, I was very lucky to have a teacher who was really kind and really open and really encouraged me to submit my writings and would talk to me about them. There was a sense that some people are going to be open and some people aren't. And so I think what the sensitivity now is going public because there's going to be both kinds of people. There's going to be the people who get it and mm -hmm. the people who don't. And do I want to have to deal with that? <laughs> Basically, can I just share it one on one? Or well, you clearly, know, you don't want to deal with that. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. When you said to me, yeah, when you said to me, I was eleven and I started writing poetry. Go back to that moment just now. What did you hear inside of your head before you said the words out loud? In the nanosecond before you spoke. Yeah, part of me just was saying, oh, this is really this is really sensitive and personal, and I don't usually talk about this, and I don't know if I should bring it up. I don't know if I should. What gave you the feeling that maybe I shouldn't say anything about this? Because it shows a much more vulnerable side of me, a much more sensitive side of me, then maybe I'm comfortable being out there. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we've stripped away a layer of protection, and you might be subjected to shame. Yeah. Because who are you to write poetry? Yeah. Or who are you to write poetry? Or, or, or poetry is stupid, like... Poetry, poetry for is sissies, stupid. right? Yeah, that really does sound like an 11 year old, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Poetry yeah. Is stupid. Yeah. Or it's not, it's for girls. Yeah, exactly. How about that yeah. one? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that feels right for the time. Yeah. All right. So that little boy who was trying to connect with his heart, and poetry is like mainlining feelings. It's like mm. opening a vein and getting an IV of deep sensitivity. That little boy, I feel for that kid. I have been there. And that kid has an enormously talented and capable ally. He has you. Mm. Who is wise and brave and capable and thoughtful and has all sorts of agency. And when the bullies on the playground laugh at him, he's going to walk over that playground and he's going to put an arm around that 11-year-old boy and he's going to say, you're going to be okay, kid. I'm right by your side because the bullies can't touch you. Yeah. How does that image land for you? It mirrors very well, not in very conscious ways, but the process that's mm -hmm. going on when I'm thinking about sharing something. There is a part of me that says, mm -hmm. I'll be okay. There's also a part that's like, maybe not so productive. And it says, I don't care what people think. Like, I don't, this is the part where it's like. <laughs> that's this, the 15 year old yeah. who's jumped in front of the 11. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Screw all these people. Yeah. So maybe make more room for the adult for sure. So I'm going to warrant and take a guess that those who are listening to us right now can relate to the experience that you've had. And in you sharing the entire arc, including the part of you that jumps in, the 15-year-old, I called it, who jumps in and says, ah, to hell with them. I won't be on social media. No. Right. I don't care what they think. Or even the part of them that's the adult that says, no, I got it. I got you, kid. As well as the 11-year-old. They're hearing your words. And just like those who read my words or hear my words and find resonance in the story, just as I read Parker's words and Sharon's words and Ani Pema's words and found resonance in their stories, mm. that entire process that's how human beings help one another. That is a mitzvah.
that is a good deed. That is how we make it safe for the next 11-year-old to say, here's my heart. I'm going to put words to my feelings. Mm. That is the force that counteracts the authoritarianism that not only dominates our political landscape, but dominates our own mindset. The bullies on the playground are nothing compared to the power of love and empathy. When we stand united and stand together and take care of each other, they don't have, they don't stand a chance. Yeah. So we're now seeing your radical inquiry mm-hmm. process in action. Well, you're right. You're making a connection by radically inquiring within. And it's radical because it means notice what was happening for you. You started to go to those feelings and then your more adult mindset kicked in to reassure yourself that you were okay. And I actually pushed that and made you go back to being 11 so that you could actually empathetically be connected to that person. And then we called forth the adult to take Mm. care. Mm. See, the impulse is to be that 15-year-old. Part of what that 15-year-old is doing is their feelings about me don't matter Mm. is a way of being an adolescent and covering Mm. our pain by saying it doesn't matter. And in fact, it does matter. It's just not, it doesn't matter as much as the 11-year-old thinks. So I wanted to ask you this, something that's deeply personal to me. Mm -hmm. And it's that meeting place of spirituality, Buddhism, like a path for, Mm -hmm. a path of growth, path of awakening. I'd, I'd like to hope that the business is not an obstacle to the path. It can be a functional part of the path. And I think you're one of the only voices that I hear out there saying that that that, that is so. And so I'd love to hear about your thoughts as business, as a, as a tool for, for, for growth, not just psychology, but spiritual growth, uh, evolution. Yeah, the subtitle in my book is Leadership in the Art of Growing Up. I'll tell you a quick story on this. Years and years and years ago, I went to a meditation retreat at a center here in Colorado. And I went to spend the weekend with Anipema children. And I had the great good fortune of being invited to tea with her mm. on a Sunday. I had arrived on Thursday, and on Saturday morning, the leadership of the center had asked me to join the board of directors. And leaving aside for a moment my own ego involved in all of that, I came to see Ani Pema on Sunday, and I said, I don't know, I just want to be a student. I, don't, I want to sit in the back of the classroom. And she just laughed, and she said, oh, boy, you've got some ego there. I was like, what? And she goes, well, you know, you're sort of avoiding the thing that is going mm. on. You're avoiding your karma. Mm. And I was like, pulled back. And she said, your karma is to combine leadership and the Dharma. Mm. And the path to happiness doesn't lie through denying your karma. So with that as context, you're right. I do see leadership and business as instrumental in this process of growing up, as I call it. But I want to be more clear. Everything is path. It's not just a tool on the path. It's not just a function. It is the path. Mm. This is what karma has put forward for you. You have a company. You Mm. have a merry band of pranksters who want to create magic in the world. And they want to use their work to express their essence. And your task is to create the conditions where Great people get to do the best work of their lives. How is that not dharma? 
Mm-hmm. See, the problem is that we see these things in opposition to each other. It's like seeing work and life as oppositional. Pablo Picasso did not say, well, some days I paint and do my work, and some days I live. William Mm -hmm. Blake didn't say, some days I write, and some days I live. He was his Mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Now, the danger is, when that's all that I am, when I sacrifice love and I sacrifice health and I sacrifice friendship and I sacrifice family for output, that's dangerous. But I never stop being me. Whether it's Saturday morning and I'm working on my new book or Sunday night and I'm talking to a client or Monday evening, I'm talking to one of my children. I am me. And that is path. Mm. That is you. So to, to me, it's quite obvious that karma has said your path is your business right now. Mm. Someday your path might be a book that you write. Someday your path might be this podcast, but it's all path. Mm. Does that resonate, make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. And maybe the the reason it doesn't always feel this way is because in some activities I bring less than my full self. And then, brother. Right. That's right. Okay. Okay. In order to, to for everything to be path, there's no holding back, right? It's not that work, by definition, is inherently an expression of a compartmentalized life. It's that we compartmentalize our life and we put work in that compartment. But you're a craftsman. You're a sculptor. The medium that you choose is different than the medium that, you know, where a sculptor might use clay, but you're still doing art. Yeah. It just happens to be this business. And, you, do, you know, the sculptor doesn't say, I'm going to hold myself back because I'm working right now. You have to be fully present to your life. Mm, that's fascinating. So... I want to dig in to make sure that I understand this Mm -hmm. a little bit more. I feel like, okay, certain things in a business need doing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And they need doing for practical reasons. Like you need to do the sales. You need to reach out to clients. You need to do, you know, marketing. Mm -hmm. You need to do. And some of these things, you know, if I bring my whole self, then I don't, Like my whole self doesn't really feel like doing some of these things or my whole self might prefer to be doing something else right now, uh, something more creative. So what is the process of being my whole self in those moments? There's an old Buddhist teaching that goes like this. Before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After Mm -hmm. enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Mm. What's that mean? I think that the enlightenment, what it changes is not necessarily the subject matter. It's the perspective on it or it's the relationship to it. It's that you're still doing the same activities. You may hate making sales calls because making sales calls puts you in that place of potential shame by being judged. Mm how workable that is, how lovely that experience is, how wonderful that experience is, because you get to use that experience to explore, why do I feel shame if I'm judged? Where did that come from? Mm. Oh, right, I'm 11 years old again, wanting to write poetry, Mm. afraid that the bigger boys are going to somehow find out. Mm. (sighs) I blow a kiss and let go of that. And let me approach the sales process 
as an opportunity to create an empathetic bond. Because who am I selling to but another human being? Who, by the way, suffered and was wounded as a child. Yeah. Everything that you say I don't want to do is an opportunity to practice. Mm. Everything that you say I want to do is an opportunity to practice. Right. That's the whole self. Mm. Yeah, that's good. I, I, I like this answer. It feels very practical. So I'd love to hear from you about your reboot approach. And then mm-hmm. also, I know you started thinking and engaging with the concept of belonging. How does that tie into this approach? Well, I, th- I think what I hear you asking is, is sort of my company, our mm. coaching style, and how we approach things. Mm. And I'll just point out you experienced it. Yeah. All right. Let's imagine for a moment that you're a coaching client and you're a CEO of a small design firm. And you call me up and you say, this part of the job I just don't want to do. Such mm. a pain in the ass. And I would have told you exactly what I told you just now. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so implicit in what we do is a kind of deeper questioning than the reflection process of looking back and trying to see things from a different perspective. Some of the aspects of that are common to reboot. Much of that is good coaching, quite mm-hmm. frankly. So that's part of what we do. On the question of belonging, You know, one of the core principles of my first book was that we are all organized for the pursuit of love, safety, and belonging. Mm. And that we use as leaders in order to turn the challenge of leadership into a path to growing up, as we just described. We use radical self-inquiry and understand that just like ourselves, Everyone around us is organized for the pursuit of love, safety, and belonging. And so when I ask the question, as I do often, how have I been complicit in creating the conditions I say I don't want in my life? One of the corollaries to that is how have I been complicit, not responsible for creating the conditions in which I don't feel loved, I don't feel safe, and I don't feel like I belong? Or Mm -hmm. if I have power, how have I created those conditions for other people? And that leads to the new work that I'm doing, which expands that notion to really look at the question of, okay, if, as I assert, that better humans make better leaders, then what is the responsibility of a better human to create what I refer to as systemic belonging. We live in society where there is systemic othering, whether it's racist, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic. We are constantly turning the other into someone who is less than. And to my mind, the only answer to systemic problems are systemic solutions. And so the question then becomes, the question of how have I been complicit starts to morph into how have I been complicit in and benefited from systemic othering? And what do I need to give up that I love in order to create systemic belonging? And that is a really challenging question, especially for those of us who hold implicit or explicit power as many uh, racially white men do. And I think that's a moral obligation to ask that question. So that's where I'm exploring in the new book. Mm. From my lips to God's ears, the manuscript will be done this summer. (laughs) I'm about halfway through. And uh, hopefully it'll be out next year, which is what the plan is. So, fingers crossed. That's wonderful. So, one final closing question. In his TED Talk, 
philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. A lecture being kind of a dry, secular, informational way of conveying information, and then you make up your own mind about what to do with it. Whereas a sermon is this, this really urgent plea to try to change someone's life. And mm. so if you were to give a short sermon today, what would be the one thing that you can make the biggest impact in people's lives? Well, I hope he, his TED Talk was a sermon and not a lecture. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that the most important thing to hold on to for anyone in all the things that we've talked about today, is the sense that we're not alone. I think the tragedy of the human experience is that when we step into the things that we suffer with, we exacerbate that problem by assuming that we're the only one who goes through that. And when we expand our horizon beyond our own experience and start to connect with other people's suffering, a magical thing happens. Our suffering is alleviated. See, when I help you, I am helping me. When I help me, I am helping you. And that, I think, is the most glorious aspect of humanity. We're in this together. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for asking the question, and thank you for having me on the show. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. Uh, we run design sprints all over the world, um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or Uh, various organizations through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake.